Okay, Sarah, uh, this this one caught me by surprise a little bit. It was awesome. Me too. Yes, wildfire recovery. And I think here we're here at Purdue, Indiana. Uh, we don't see a lot of wildfires. No, and no, we don't. You mentioned several times that I think both of us were expecting to hear about, oh, let's plant some trees to recover. Wow. You want to talk about getting blown away with information about just the entire, this whole field of disaster science that I had. Yes. I Why do you say fires are part of the natural world? It's only a disaster because people have made it so. Not the angles I thought that we were going. I was so, yes. I was like, wow, I, I had never thought of this. Hey, so yes. I, I learned a lot uh, about wildfire recovery and it made me think about other disasters and uh, how preparing and recovering for other disasters. So this was a really good one. I enjoyed it. Joining us today on Superheroes of Science, we are so excited to welcome Dr. Ronnie Schumann. Um, Dr. Schumann is an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Management and Disaster Science at the University of North Texas. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Stephen. Pleasure to be here. Um, this is great. I'm looking forward to talking all, to y'all today about uh, wildfire recovery, right? That's today's topic. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So that, uh, that's where we want to go with it. Now, you had mentioned when we were talking earlier that mm -hmm. uh, you you haven't always done wildfire recovery. You, you have, it sounds like you have, it's uh, went a roundabout way of getting there. So I, it, I would like just briefly, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. tell us a little bit about the different things you've researched. Sure. Um, so I, I started my life, you know, in academia, right? My college career was all about meteorology. I loved the weather. I'm fascinated by hurricanes, tornadoes. I grew up in Southern Louisiana. So like flood prone USA. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so very, very interested in all kinds of climatological and atmospheric events. Um, then midway during my undergrad career in 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit. Um, and that had a huge influence on shaping my trajectory after that. Um, we were very fortunate in that we were not flooded. We got some wind damage where we were, but a lot of my close friends and relatives did flood very bad and uh, took a long time to recover. And so a lot of my questions became uh, those of recovery. How do communities that are impacted recover? Why does one recover quicker than another? And so that kind of shaped my trajectory. Um, so I've looked at recovery after Hurricane Katrina uh, mostly in Mississippi, not Louisiana, um, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Florence, you're sensing a theme. Then about four years ago, um, I got involved with the collaborative um, that was doing some wildfire research, looking at what do we know about recovery after wildfires. And so we started doing some case studies around the U.S., looking at uh, fires in Florida and California and Texas. And right now I'm doing a current project on wildfire recovery in three counties in California, uh, Butte, Lake, and Sonoma that have been really heavily impacted since 2015. The Valley Fire, the Camp Fire, the Tubbs Fire, those are all big events that probably come to mind, especially if you live in the West or have been paying attention to the news. So we're kind of digging in there and uh, learning more. And so I will say a lot of my examples today are from California, just because that's on the top of my mind. Oh, well, that, that makes definitely sense. makes sense. And yeah. those are the ones we all hear about. All right. So wildfire recovery, it's uh, definitely what I call a socio-ecological dilemma, right? Because there's a human dimension to it. There's an ecological dimension to all this. Um, so we'll talk about how the pieces connect here. Some real key points I want to leave you with. Um, first off, there's no such thing as a natural disaster. Disasters are all about human losses and even the causal factors that shape them have human fingerprints all over them, right? Disasters occur because we as humans are not adapted to the natural environments in which we live. Um, second point I wanna kind of leave you with um, and I want you to think about as we go through this presentation is recovery itself. It's a process that is long, complex, and uneven. Um, so some of my pictures I'll show you in just a second from the Mississippi coast, some of my previous research, those were taken about seven, eight, nine years after Hurricane Katrina and it looks like she might've just blown through. So recovery takes much longer uh, than the news cameras show us, much longer than that year or two when they're interested. Sometimes it takes decades and there's inequality uh, that is magnified as a result of going through recovery. So those with less often tend to end up with less even after recovery. 
Um, and then finally, resilience to wildfires means becoming fire adapted. So we've been in this cycle for the past 75 years where um, we'll have a forest fire or a wildfire. We just beat it down with suppression resources. We bring in the firefighters, we bring in the planes, we extinguish it. We're devoting a lot of money and time and resource to firefighting. Um, but guess what? that isn't sustainable. We can't rebuild in the same ways. We can't devote all our resources to response. We really have to become adapted to a landscape where fire is present all the time. And of course, climate change is a part of that. So we'll, we'll talk about that too. So I want to um, explain before we get too deep in the weeds, what disaster science is, since you introduced me, Sarah, as part of a department of emergency management and disaster science, what are these two things? Um, disaster science is kind of a fusion of three academic disciplines, if you will, three traditions, disaster sociology, hazards geography, that's the side of the house I hail from, and risk analysis. And so each of these traditions asks particular kinds of questions that all have a bearing on how disasters play out. So for disaster sociologists, they're really interested in how humans respond during times of crisis. Hazards geographers like me, we tend to be very interested in how humans interact with their environment, how people in place coincide and interact. And then people from the risk analysis tradition uh, want to know how do humans perceive and adjust to risks because actual risk and what we perceive as our risk are actually two very different things and they don't always meet. <laughs> so today, a lot of disaster scientists, and I consider myself one, fuse all of these traditions in the questions that we ask and the projects that we take on. And our results really lead to practical knowledge in the field of emergency management. So that's kind of the career path that you can take from studying disaster science. So why recovery? Um, we talked a little bit about this before we got started about Hurricane Katrina and, and the impacts there. And really I'm, I'm showing you two pictures here. One on the left is a picture I took of a, a car with the um, X marking the urban search and rescue marking that shows you know, when someone searched the area and if they found bodies or, or injuries um, and the team that, that searched it. Uh, New Orleans was all about a, a scenery of decay after the hurricane, whereas Mississippi um, which I did field research in was all about destruction. I mean, total destruction. Storm surge came over, overwashed cities, went half a mile inland. It was just a very, um, it was a, a tragic scene, a moving scene, a, um, yeah, I'm hard, I'm finding it hard to put into words, actually. I'm starting to get a little emotional looking at these. Uh, but this was such a visceral landscape for me that I experienced that it led me to look at recovery. So how does one come back from a landscape that is totally devastated like this? How does one put their life together, their community back together? Um, and so that's, that's how I got into this. The pictures here that I'm showing you on the bottom are from some of my more recent field work. This was like 2010 to 2015 time range. Um, and this is what long-term recovery looks like. Um, some of these scenes look like life after people, right? You've got, uh, you know, the, the fence and the overgrown weeds and some raised houses in the background. So some people have kind of adapted to the reality that they live in a storm surge zone. But so many people have not come back. And we see this checkerboarded landscape of empty lots, vacant parcels, and maybe slabs that have been cleared. And Oh, the random house where people have come back rebuilt and are living in it. This is what long-term recovery looks like. And this is what I mean when I say it's uneven. And there's a story behind each of those parcels too. So that's the complexity. What is recovery? If I were to define it simply for you, it would be putting a disaster stricken community back together. What I don't like about that particular uh, definition is the idea that disasters just happen to people. People play a large role in creating uh, disasters and disaster losses, so we can't forget that. I'll explain what is the disaster is in just a second. Um, I like to define recovery like this, a post-disaster period of adjustment uh, after an event when individuals, families, and communities are all working to overcome the effects of disaster and really regain functionality. So you're trying to put your life back together, your home back together, your routines back together, um, and really recover from the trauma you've endured. There are ethical questions in recovery too. Recovery to what? What is the end goal and who might be influencing that? What political or economic actors are influencing that? 
Um, and recovery for whom? Who gets to come back? Who gets to rebuild? Who, who gets to do that? And who has access to the resources? So depending on the R word, and there are a lot of R words that fly around during recovery, restoration, repopulation, restitution, rehabilitation, they're all used interchangeably. So recovery itself is kind of taken for granted. Depending on what R word you use, that kind of hints at what you see that end goal as or what your motivation might be in recovery. Okay. So last bit of background here, what makes a disaster, okay? Couple ingredients, we need a hazard. So something with the potential to cause harm. It can be natural, it can be man-made. Uh, we've got a picture of hail here. Add to it something that is prone to loss, be it a human themselves who is prone to loss or uh, a structure or something of humans, human stuff. We have a greenhouse here, put them together. Hail and greenhouses don't mix. Ah, we have losses, we have a disaster. Humans and their stuff have been lost. Um, probably not humans. I hope no one was in that greenhouse. Um, but if you were, you know, the owner of that greenhouse, I'm sure you would look at this and say, oh my gosh, that's a disaster. In the, um, in the professional world, we tend to refer to disasters as, uh, as bigger events. Bigger events, scale is a part of what a disaster is. So the idea is that we have so much damage, so much suffering going on in one location that we as a community or a city need to ask for outside help to manage it to deal with the impacts. So I'm here in, um, in Denton, Texas. And so if we had a disaster in Denton, Texas, we would ask the state of Texas to come in and help. And if the state of Texas said, oh gosh, that's such a big tornado, we can't do anything about it. You know, we don't have all the resources we need. They would then ask the federal government to step in. And that's when FEMA kind of enters the picture and enters the equation. So I wanted to, to stop and ask, you looked like you had a question there for a minute, Stephen, before we, we go into wildfire itself. Not necessarily a question, it's, it's, I had not thought of it this way. And when I think of wildfire recovery, the last thing I thought about was the, the anthropologic aspect of it, you know, but what are, you know, the people, and in fact, it's a disaster only defined by what, because people have lost things. And I had never thought of it that way. Anything, anytime I thought of, oh, wildlife recovery, oh, that's like planting saplings, you know? <laughs> and so it's, I'm like, oh, yeah, this this makes sense. Yeah, you're raising a lot of really excellent points. And and I especially love that you're bringing in like the ethical factors involved in this and, and how that's so, yeah, this is fantastic. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's talk about wildfire recovery specifically and how, why do we have so many wildfire disasters? I feel like I have to answer that question before we move through what the recovery process is. Um, and, and really to do that, we have to look at the vulnerability piece of the equation because wildfire has always been a part of our landscape. Wildfire is part of the natural environment, that's the hazard. But really it's the vulnerability that we've created over time, especially, uh, and I'm gonna just use the Western United States and California as, as an example there, in the way we've kind of built and maladapted to our environment there. So wildfire vulnerability for the US and for the West really breaks down into three pieces, fuel, ignition, and spread. So over time, uh, if we go back to like the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a lot of logging in the West, a lot of clear cutting of timber. Um, and afterwards there was regrowth, like you say. So that is part of recovery. What comes back after the fire, what regrows? Well, what was regrowing was a lot of grasses, a lot of quick growing trees, pine trees, not the old growth, hard timber. Um, and then we had people who wanted to move into this area, right? Logging towns, gold mining towns, you name it. Um, and they're bringing in their landscaping, right? So we love these exotic bushes and shrubs that just you know, make our house look like something from another part of the world. And these are exotic species that aren't necessarily adapted to the wildfire regime, the natural pattern of wildfire in the area. Um, so we have species that are introduced, species that are blown in by the wind that wouldn't normally be there without the clear cutting. And then over time we have regrowth and lack of maintenance. So we as people, um, this is a house that is just enshrouded in trees. <laughs> uh, for those of you listening, um, we have this feeling, I, I think it's, it's innate as humans. We like green. We want to be surrounded by nature and feel like, you know, we're, we're in nature's uh, blanket. It's just wrapping itself around us. And that goes to being surrounded by green. But guess what? 
The thinned forest is actually the healthy forest, not this picture where you have all of these dry grasses and surface fuels that can move fire up into the saplings and then up into this canopy of really resinous pine trees that are super flammable. So yeah, we've kind of made this landscape because we like being around green and we, we haven't really maintained our forests. Um, and extreme drought, that's the other piece of the fuel picture, right? So green vegetation is fine, but when it dries out and you know, in the West, we have seasonal droughts, prolonged droughts and climate changes adding to their length and their frequency. So we're seeing that across the West this year as last year, really this is a seven year drought that's been going on. Ignition, the second piece of that, that vulnerability picture. So we have fuel, we need a spark, right? Enter Smokey the Bear. Only you can prevent firefighters. He's fluffy, he's fun, but you know, people I think took his message a little bit too far. Sure, you wanna control your campfires, but not all fire is bad. So we have since the 1940s when Smokey was introduced, started to perceive all fire as bad. The green uh, overgrown forest is great and any fire that disrupts that is bad. That's not the case. Uh, of course, at the same time, we have a lot of urban growth, a lot of development, a lot of suburbanization going on in the West over this, you know, 50, 75 year period post World War II to the present. And we're building subdivisions out into the wildland and creating um, a, a very extensive wildland urban interface or WUI. Yes, I kind of chuckle every time I hear the word WUI because that, that's something unique to the wildfire arena, um, but WUI, W-U-I areas where the development meets the wilderness. And because we're developing in this way and we're running these power lines and utilities out to people, the power lines are vulnerable to sparking or trees falling on them. And of course, if you have people living out here, you can have a wildfire going on that just burns itself into the area and creates this burn scar, like what you see in this picture where literally a whole street has been taken out by a fire whoosh swooping in from the, the wildland. And third, the third ingredient is spread, um, embers. And this is not something that I really started thinking about until I got into the wildfire arena, um, is the fact that really embers are the danger. You know, fire can spread along the ground, but let's say you have a fire break or a six lane freeway, it's gonna stop that surface fire from moving across the landscape. But once you get a fire that's moved up into the treetops and is this big crown fire, You've got winds blowing through the canyons in the west, and it's blowing the embers miles ahead of the actual fire front, and it's landing on houses that might not even be in the in the wooey, might be far beyond that wildland urban interface. And it's catching in gutters that haven't been cleaned. It's catching on landscaping that's planted right around houses. It's burning through houses that might not be built with the, um, the best materials, non-flammable materials. So yeah, we have pictures like this, Coffee Park in um, Sonoma County, California, not in the buoy at all, um, but because of the embers and the high winds, the wildfire spread into that area and the density of the houses, the combustibility of the materials and the way we built our neighborhood, the whole thing was leveled to the ground in the Tufts fire in 2017. So this is vulnerability, this is how we make it. So wildfire losses are growing because we've made so much vulnerability for ourselves. Um, and what's important here is not necessarily those orange bars, which kind of capture your attention, but really the red and black lines here. So you can see that what we've experienced in the last seven to eight years is four, five, six times what we had experienced any year before that going back as far as we've kept records on disaster losses. And I've looked at other data sources that take this back about 30 more years to the 60s. Same pattern holds. We are in a new era. Wildfire losses are growing. Wildfires themselves are bigger than they used to be. You can look at this and see the light colored yellows, the smaller fires that were generally uh, more frequent uh, or you know, frequent small low intensity fires were kind of the norm. Today, we've got these raging massive wildfires. So the coverage has just, um, has blown up and the frequency is increasing too. So let's talk about impacts. Once your community is impacted by wildfire, what happens? Um, what happens and how do you recover from it? So there are obviously gonna be injuries, maybe deaths, uh, hopefully not many. We saw that after the campfire, people trying to evacuate and, uh, and they died in their cars. 
Um, it was really tragic. Uh, so we do see that in some events. We see property loss, homes level to the ground, businesses leveled, poor air quality. And I'm sure y'all are experiencing that up, you know, yes. up in Indiana. I've, same thing here in Texas. We've had some really poor air quality days the past couple of weeks. And it's all of the smoke that comes from these wildfires. Think about you know, farm workers in California who are working outside exposed to that all the time who can't really stay inside because their job demands them being outside. A lot of these are, are immigrants or, or undocumented people, right? So that's kind of that hinting at those um, inequalities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, ecologically, in terms of the impacts, we're looking at maybe invasive or exotic species that are able to enter an area that are not adapted to fire or the drought cycle in that place. So things like guinea grass, cheap grass that have moved into um, uh, most of the, the Intermountain West, the Great Basin region is overrun by cheap grass these days. Uh, red ants, yeah, they're an invasive species. Uh, after the Bastrop fire in 2011 in Texas took out a lot of the tree cover in the Lost Pines ecosystem, it invited a lot of these red fire ants to just move in because they like sunlight and uh, a really not a dense canopy. They like no canopy. They like to be in sunlight. And then that posed a threat to this endangered toad that was, uh, you know, that was the home <laughs> ecosystem. So yeah, you have a lot of these dynamics going on at really small scales. Um, and then you have the possibility of ecosystem conversion. Um, so that's when, say, a, a pine forest might turn into an oak forest, which is more drought adapted. Or you might have a whole scale conversion from a forested landscape to a grassland. And when we get out of balance, when we get out of sync with our fire regimes, the fires are burning more intense and more frequently than they used to, there's more of a danger of that happening. So this is a real, real danger in the West now. Let's move through that, that recovery cycle. So recovery really starts in response. So you think about evacuations, you're responding to a fire that's, that's actively going on or is uh, just been extinguished. There's some people needs, a lot of people needs after a fire, shelter, food, clothing, counseling. So this is all happening kind of as the firefighters are still putting out the blaze. Uh, this is a lot of the role we play as the general public when we donate to the Red Cross or the Salvation Army or any number of nonprofit organizations. We call them voluntary organizations active in disaster or VOADs. That's what we call it in the emergency management world. If you're eager to help, uh, one tip I have, send money, not stuff. If you take one thing from this presentation, please remember that. Um, here are some of my pictures from Hurricane Harvey. This is what happens to donations that we send into disaster areas, be it mountains of water bottles that end up sitting in the sun and become undrinkable, uh, or fields of clothing, boxes of clothing that literally have been sitting there. There's no place to keep them. The buildings have been destroyed. The buildings need to house people, so there's no place to warehouse this stuff. Uh, that particular field of clothes that you see in that parking lot, um, that had been occupied by rats, it had been rained on, it was starting to mildew. Oh. It, basically by sending in debris, uh, by sending in clothing, by sending in supplies, we've created more debris for the emergency managers to then clean out of an area. So. Oh. I would not have thought about that. Yeah, and that's a really great, and, and perhaps you would have some recommendations, you know, if money is the best. I know, um, are there organizations that are legitimate that we don't have to worry that they'll be misused or is there always a threat of misuse and I don't know. <laughs> great question, great question. So, so VOAD that I mentioned, there's actually a national volunteer organizations active in disaster in VOAD, so in voad.org. If you go there, you're gonna see a list of about 60 organizations. Most of them are nationwide. They're reputable, they are trained and they work together. Uh, so they're not duplicating needs. And yes, they are reputable organizations you can donate to. Um, so the likes of Red Cross, Salvation Army, Catholic Charities, a lot of other faith-based organizations. And I will say the faith-based organizations, they do not uh, privilege people of their faith when they give and when they donate. And there is no you know, proselytization or anything like that going on. So they're very ethical about how they use it and meeting people's needs regardless of who you are. Um, so yeah, that's what I would recommend going to. If you want to donate, find an organization on there you like and donate to one of those. So with, with that aside, 
also uh, what's going on in short-term recovery besides all that altruistic work that we're doing as the general public and people in the disaster zone are helping each other. There's also some boosterism that goes on. You see those t-shirts that always get made after every disaster? Jersey's yeah, yeah. strong, California's strong, Texas strong, right? We're, we're optimists by nature as humans and we're just trying to, to come together as a group. So there's some really positive aspects of this. There's a darker side when that turns into politicians saying we need to rebuild bigger and better. Maybe, maybe not. We need to rebuild smarter and better adapted. So, you know, take that boosterism with a grain of salt sometimes. Uh, and then C, so these are kind of the ABCs of long-term recovery, altruism, boosterism, cleanup. They're all going on at the same time. Um, so with a wildfire, you're dealing with um, a lot of denuded landscape. So there are efforts to build silt fences and control erosion to prevent water quality issues. Um, we have to remove dangerous trees from roads, from lots, from over public schools and other facilities, right? You know, we don't want a tree falling on anyone after the event and that being, you know, a cause for death or injury. And then there's a lot of hazardous materials removal. And this too was something that I had not thought about before talking to fire survivors. Um, because you know, in the hurricane and flood world, we go in and we muck out houses and we get the, you know, the mud out and clean things up. And that is kind of a way of building community with one another after disaster and really lifting ourselves up. After fire disaster, think about all of the chemicals we keep in our houses and all of the chemicals that go into making the products that build our houses. It's too dangerous for the general public people, property owners even, to go and clean up their own properties. So oftentimes it's the city or county that you're living in that has to contract for hazardous materials removal before you can actually start that rebuild process. Oh, would not wow. have thought about that. Yeah. Yes. So if you as a wildfire survivor are going back to your property to see if anything is left, you definitely want to bring the N95 masks. You want to you know, be masked, have gloves on. You want to have some protection because you don't want to inhale what's coming off of that pile of rubble. Um, and I know you want to go look for your wedding picture or your you know, family photos and things, but you, know, you need to protect yourself and you can't clean up everything. That's the thing. So PPE is required. That is just a totally, and not living in an area where we yeah. have fires, that is just a totally novel idea. And I totally, I can get what you're saying about cleaning up flooding and things. Yeah, right. That builds community and you're cleaning this up, but then, wow. Yeah. No, that gave me pause. And that is a huge delay in recovery for wildfire survivors is that the city has to come in and remove all the hazardous materials before you can start to look at the future of what you're going to do with your lot, with your property. And I can see where that would do a lot, maybe, maybe do a lot where you, there's a lot to be said for going in and yourself and cleaning up yourself and kind of getting that, you know, that mental side of, you know, feeling like you can do something. And it's almost what, what I'm hearing you say is there's, that would be difficult to sit through and know there's nothing I can do until I get the green light. It's very disempowering, right? Yes. So yeah, That's clean up after question. hurricanes and floods are so empowering. Yes. Clean up after wildfire is very disempowering. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then in the longer term, okay, so let's say we've cleaned things up. There might be other pieces of the community that need to be put back together before you can start rebuilding. So utilities have to be put back in place. So power lines, uh, water and sewer. This is a huge problem in the campfire in 2018 in California is that the, uh, a lot of the PVC piping and things that we use for our sewer and septic systems had contaminated the soil and then they were not safe themselves to run water through to houses. So the whole water system had to be replaced. If you're on a well water system, you might have to redig a well or replace that system due to contamination, uh, right? Because that uh, benzene is released when some of these chemicals burn, cancer causing. So yeah, you've got that side of things. You've got to restore those utilities and, and critical infrastructures, what we call it. Then you can start rebuilding homes, rebuilding businesses, rebuilding a tax base, right? That's really the concern of local government. So bringing back businesses, bringing back tourists, um, but doing so in a safe way. Uh, and of course, insurance is a big part of the way we recover from disasters. And insurance is uh, kind of tough and bureaucratic to navigate. Um, California right now has a moratorium in effect on um, 
insurance companies not renewing people's policies. It's set to expire in about a month from now. Um, so we're, we're unsure what's going to happen to people, right? Because if you have a mortgage in this country, uh, you must maintain insurance on your property. Yeah. So not being able to find insurance or afford insurance is a huge problem. And I heard all about this with regard to flood insurance um, in, in Mississippi and flood insurance doubling, tripling, quadrupling uh, for some of these folks. And really it was the affordability that made them unable to come back. Uh. So I, I did wanna mention this since you said you have a lot of general listeners, um, you know, just beyond high school students might, who might be listening to this, um, resources for recovery. The way recovery works in this country is insurance is your primary uh, lifeline. It's your primary safety net. Make sure you have insurance. If you rent, get renter's insurance. It costs maybe 100 to 120 bucks a year. It will replace your contents if your home burns. Um, it is very affordable, highly recommend. I ask my students every semester, show of hands who has renter's insurance. Inevitably, you know, less than 20% of the class raises their hand. It's like everybody in here who's renting needs insurance. Um, so homeowners insurance, renters insurance, flood insurance, if you're in a flood zone, that's your primary lifeline. And after that, only if a federal disaster is declared by the president, uh, do we have access to SBA loans. So that's from the Small Business Administration. Um, and those are low interest loans that can help you cover the, the gap needs that insurance doesn't. Um, and then FEMA individual assistance. FEMA does offer grant funding to individuals and households to help with rental assistance, rebuilding uh, necessities, things like you know getting you mattresses to sleep on or a TV to be able to receive uh, information. But that individual assistance is not going to make you whole. Uh, the maximum threshold, if you meet all the income requirements, is somewhere in the thirty-five thousand dollar range. That is not going to rebuild your house. So. Relying on those other sources is gonna be key. Sometimes there are state-led programs. A lot of the survivors from the California fires are waiting on settlements from Pacific Gas and Electric. So that might also play a role in uh, funding recovery for you, but really the big three, insurance, SBA loans, and FEMA. Apply to FEMA at a disaster recovery center. Um, if they tell you that you have been um, uh, declined funding, that does not mean you're not eligible appeal. Always appeal the decision and keep appealing it. <laughs> but you can see it, it would be deflating to receive that news. Oh, I'm not going to get any aid. Appeal it. Sometimes it's the fact that they haven't gone through the paperwork thoroughly or one, one side of the house isn't talking to the other about your situation. Um, so that's my advice. The other piece of the picture, we always think about having a go bag uh, to be able to leave before a wildfire. Um, we also need to think about preparing for recovery as part of that. So keep copies of your important documents in your go bag, you know, so title to a house or, or you know, mortgage statements, insurance statements, that kind of thing, passports, driver's licenses, right? We want copies of all of that in our go bag. Um, and saving documents to the cloud, it's wonderful. We can make digital backups of that kind of stuff and that can save you and get you access to these, these resources. The other thing are the family photos, and I mentioned that a second ago, advice from Hurricane Country, get a Rubbermaid tub, put all your family photos in it at the beginning of summer, and keep it packed until Christmas right next to your go bag. If you, leave, if you need to leave in a rush, you'll want those family photos and heirlooms, and you're, you might not have time to go and search through the house and, and gather them and still leave safely. So long-term recovery, as we move into the long-term, really remembering uh, is the theme here. Do, do I stay? Do I go? Um, I might be very attached to this place emotionally or attached to the natural environment. Uh, that might impact my decision to rebuild here or, or to go to another place that's similar. And that's what we saw in Paradise. A lot of survivors moved from Paradise up the hills to Chester and Greenville, which just last week were leveled in, a, in the Dixie Fire. Um, so they are getting this repeat trauma because their homes had just been destroyed three years ago. They moved to what they thought was a safe place. It wasn't in the Wadland Urban Interface, right? They moved to another Rui location and then were leveled again. Ouch. So that place attachment, this is really, this is my research is, is this kind of areas. How do people's attachments to place kind of impact decision making and how we rebuild and, and where we go? 
All right, and some, some challenges to recovery, finding stable housing, right? You might go through a series of rentals. Um, so, many, uh, so many renters I talked to in Mississippi, they listed you know, six, eight addresses that they lived at in the first year. There's so much displacement ongoing in recovery. It's, you can't imagine it till you talk to people or have gone through it yourself, how much you're constantly changing addresses, trying to find housing that is adequate, accessible, affordable for your family. Um, and of course, if you're not there in the town to get access to the aid that's available after disaster, you might lose out in the long run. Um, other, other issues like airship properties where the title is unclear or tough to, to grant aid to from the FEMA standpoint, citizenship status, disability, uh, language and literacy affects your ability to understand paperwork and access all of these resources. Rebuilding is expensive. The insurance, you know, will pay for the value of your home, but oftentimes replacement costs exceed the value of the home. So that's the quandary a lot of folks are stuck in. Contractors, both finding them, finding them, uh, finding contract contractors who are trustworthy, who are honest, who are affordable. Um, these are these are big problems. And then, of course, having knowledge about how do I rebuild in a safe way that's going to reduce my risk in the future. So. Yeah. That's where I want to kind of lead us here at the end of the presentation is how do we reduce fire risk in recovery and become fire adapted? So the last pieces to this becoming fire adapted, we need to manage our vegetation better. So, you know, in the West, you see a lot of programs that, that do mastication of forests, shipping, um, trying to get rid of those, those ladder fuels, uh, roadside fuel breaks. Uh, the Redding uh, car fire in Redding in 2018 was actually caused by a flat tire and the rim of that tire generating sparks and sh shooting off into the forest oh, wow. next to the road. So roadside fuel breaks are good. You don't want the, uh, you know, the overgrowth. Grazing, goats are cute, sheep are cute. Yes, we can use them in productive ways to clear out some of that vegetation. And we have to get away from the idea that fire is bad because we've got to have prescribed burns to keep the forests thin. Thin forests are healthy forests. Um, neighborhoods, right? We can do a lot as homeowners uh, as we rebuild to rebuild in safer ways using better materials that are non-combustible, using soffit vents that don't allow embers into the attic. Um, you can see in this picture up at the left, we have a house that's built of stucco. I'm not sure if that's a metal roof or not, but probably fire resistant. And then you've got this zone of concrete or stones in a, you know, a five foot perimeter around the house. So that's what we call the non-combustible zone. You don't want to have landscaping there. You want to have non-burnable surfaces there. And that can really prevent fire from entering the house. And then the soffit vents and uh, other materials can prevent embers from entering the house using native landscaping that's drought adapted um, is great. Keeping your uh, lawns cleared of debris, so giving the firefighters that defensible space to come in and actually defend your home if the fire gets that close. Avoid pathways for fire and embers. So here are some pictures of what not to do. These are actually some pictures out of Texas after the Bastrop fire in uh, 2011. Um, a, a wooden bench on the porch, not a good idea. A driftwood collection on your front porch, probably not a good idea. Um, <laughs> the second picture this house looks like, you know, maybe the siding is fire resistant and the roof is fire resistant, but we have this pathway for fire with the untreated wooden staircase or this deck <laughs> that's right here attached to our home. So that's how fire enters. Uh, and then finally, risk-based planning uh, is the other piece of creating a fire-adapted community. So using regulatory tools like uh, building codes, uh, building permits are the way to enforce that. I know as survivors, we just want to rebuild and get back into our homes, but that permitting process is actually part of the, the safety mechanism that'll keep you safe in the future. So if you look at it that way, it, it might kind of take away some of the pain of the delay. And, uh, and disclosing that risk to future buyers. Some states really don't have a lot of great laws in effect to uh, pass information on the hazards from one homeowner to the next who buys the place. Road widening, we've gotta have uh, roads wide enough to get fire trucks into these areas, not these narrow little streets with the overgrowth hanging over. And we've got to use history as a guide. You know, in, in the West, so much of the fire spread is dictated by where the mountains and canyons are, or what are the local wind patterns in that area, and fire burns in the same area many, many times. 
So not building into these canyons and wind corridors is going to be key if we're going to prevent fires in the future. So I do see some shreds of hope in, um, in the research I've been conducting out west that we're starting to shift from a reactive mindset to a proactive one. As uh, Gilbert White, the father of hazards geography, said, floods may be acts of God, but flood losses are largely acts of man. We can take that and apply that to wildfires. And I think a lot of survivors and a lot of the organizations, the nonprofits we've been working with on the ground are realizing that we have to be proactive in all these ways to really live with fire. So there is a lot of local capacity, a lot of learning that's going on. Communities are starting to learn from other communities and that's wonderful to see because you've gotta have people on the ground, people living in these communities really coming to this mindset that fire is part of this landscape and I need to adapt to it, not say we're going to get rid of it entirely. Yeah. And then finally, indigenous knowledge. And this is something that I think is so important. I, I spoke with, um, it wasn't a tribal elder, but uh, a person in charge of an organization that, that works with some of the tribes um, in California. And, and she, she had this quote that just stuck out to me. And I just want to say it and repeat it here. Uh, Fire is speaking. So today, fire is speaking to us. It is telling us that we are out of balance. We are not in harmony with the natural environment. So if we think of the West as, as wilderness, as unoccupied, yeah, of course, we're going to think that green overgrown forest is healthy. But guess what? Indigenous peoples have lived in this area for tens of thousands of years, and they were the ones who were thinning the forests and managing the forests and using their cultural burning practices to, uh, to burn where it's healthy and support this regrowth. And so getting back into that balance with nature uh, is part of what I think we have to do if we're going to live with fire in our future. Nice. That's where I want to end it today. So questions, any, any reactions? Wow. Uh, that, very inform very that, informative. That very informative. And just, I feel like you really gave us a lot of just very interesting insight into, especially for, I know for the two of us, especially not living in a place where wildfires are, where we really see them very often. This is very um, helpful to hear. Awesome. So glad to, to be here. And I put my email up there, ronald.schumann at unt.edu. If you're listening to this, if you're a teacher or student and want to reach out, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to chat with y'all. So thanks so much for having me, Stephen and Sarah. This was great. Thank you.